the committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, I'm going to declare the meeting open. Um, in the room um, with myself present, I also have Kelly Armstrong, the Vice Chair, and Andy Allen. And on the telephones at present, or via Starleaf, we have Mark Durkin, Fran McCann, and Sinead Innes, and we have Robin also on a voice call. So that's that done. Okay, can I just remind members uh, again, this is the same system we used last week. You have to be invited to speak. Everybody will be on mute. Otherwise, um, so if you want to speak, there is a hands button on your um, your table or your laptops. So you just press the button to put your hand up, and I see it here on my screen. And if you pushed it by mistake, can you make sure you take it down again? Or if you don't want to ask a question, take it down again, and then we'll not come to you. Um, and also, um, yeah, if you just wait a few seconds, like we do in the chamber, when you're called to speak. <coughs> Excuse me. When you're called to speak, if you wait a few seconds for um, the system to activate your microphone. So that's it. So hopefully we'll have a, as smooth a meeting as we did last week. It all went well. Um, I'll then move on then to our first agenda item, which is apologies. And I have one apology, and that is from Jonathan Buckley. He can't join us today. It's a constituency issue he has to deal with. I'll move on then to agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. Um, members, I know we're all aware uh, that Minister Hargey is t had to temporarily step aside, um, and I think it would be good of us as a committee to um, send a, a note to Deidre just to wish her well and for a speedy return, and also to send a, a, a letter or note on to the new minister, to Carol McKillen, um, wishing her well and um, you know, advising her that we will be helping in her in any way we can. Um, are members in agreement with that? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I want to move on to agenda item number three, which is your draft minutes. Um, you'll find those at page five of your meeting pack. Um, can I mem ask members, are they content with the draft minutes um, of the 11th of June 2020? Everybody content? Agreed. No hands are up, so that's good. Okay, then we're going to move on then to matters arising, which is agenda item number four. Members have been provided at page 14 with a departmental reply to queries on housing executive and corporation tax. Can I ask members, have they any comment or are they content to note? Kelly, go ahead. Um, just on the corporation tax, I think that we, we now can see very clearly that there is an issue um, with regards to corporation tax and I appreciate that there will be a review of the housing executive. Um, I know it's to come probably after the summer period, but it would be worthwhile if we asked the department when they come forward to discuss the housing executive that this any updates on that issue could be brought then as well. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Any other members? Any comment on that? Are content to move on? Okay. We're content to move on. Um, I'm going to move on then to agenda item number five, which is departmental briefing on the immigration and social security coordination EU withdrawal bill legislative consent motion. Members have been provided with papers starting at page 17 of your meeting packs. And can I welcome to the meeting Anne McCleary. Jerry McCann, Michelle Grills, and Seamus Cassidy. So, Anne, we're going to put the spotlight on you and ask you then if you okay. could brief the committee. Hello, hello, committee. It's, it feels a bit strange doing it like this. This is my first time at this, so apologies. Um, can we just check actually that Jerry McCann is on the line because he wasn't 100% sure if he could be heard? Hello, can you hear me? I can yes, hear we you, can hear you. yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, so. Oh, OK, well, I'm here, OK, and uh, I'm so too, I, as such, uh, I'm Seamus Casting, OK? And so okay. we're both on the same number. OK, Thank cheers. You. OK, OK, that's fine then. Uh, right, thank you very much for the invite to attend. Uh, we're very pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today about the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill, and in particular the uh, proposed legislative consent motion. We've provided the committee with written briefing on the bill, including a copy of the draft legislative consent memorandum. The bill was originally introduced at Westminster in the 2017-19 session, but Parliament was prorogued before the December 19 general election. The bill was then reintroduced to Parliament on the 5th of March, and it's currently going through committee stage in the House of Commons. 
Uh, if I can just preface this briefing by emphasising at the outset that immigration and freedom of movement within the EEA are accepted matters under Schedule 2 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, and they are the responsibility of the Home Office. So it's just worthwhile highlighting that at the beginning. Now, if the committee are content, I'll briefly run through the main provisions of the bill. Uh, in summary, the bill, firstly, repeals the main retained EU law relating to free movement and brings EEA nationals and their family members under UK immigration control. Secondly, it protects the status of Irish, Irish citizens in UK immigration law once their EU free movement rights end. Thirdly, it introduces powers to enable the Westminster government and devolved authorities to amend retained EU law governing social security coordination, thereby enabling policy changes to be delivered post EU exit. Now, the primary purpose of the bill is to end the EU's rules on free movement of goods in respect of the UK at the end of the transition period, 31 December 2020. These are currently retained in UK law by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. This will mean that EEA nationals not resident in the UK at the end of the transition period and their family members will require permission to enter and remain in the UK under the Immigration Act 1971. And as I said at the outset, immigration and freedom of movement within the EEA are, accept are accepted matters under Schedule 2 to the Northern Ireland Act 98, and there, that's the responsibility of the Home Office. However, in addition to that, the bill also makes provision for the Westminster government or, where appropriate, a devolved authority to amend retained EU legislation relating to the social security coordination regime. And that's where the CLCM comes in. The legislation in question is regulation, that's EC number 883, oblique 2004, on the coordination of social security systems and its associated implementing regulation, regulation EC number 987, 2009. Secondly, Regulation EEC number 1408 of 91 on the application of social security schemes to employed persons, to self-employed persons and to members of their families moving within the community and its associated implementing regulation, Regulation EEC number 574 of 72. And thirdly, Regulation EC number 859 of 2003 extending the provisions of regulation EEC number 1408 of 71 and regulation EEC number 574 of 72 to nationals of third countries who are not already covered by those provisions solely on the ground of their nationality. That's a bit of a mouthful, all of that. While immigration and freedom of movement are accepted matters, aspects of the EU social security coordination regulations touch on devolved issues which is why the LCM process is now being followed. The regulations are a somewhat complex web of accepted, in other words, we can't touch them, and devolved issues, including one, determination of the state to which contributions should be paid. Secondly, competency for the award of benefits. Thirdly, aggregation of contributions and periods of residence for benefit entitlement. And finally, provision for some benefits, such as child benefit, which are the responsibility of HMRC. The provisions in the bill which deal with transferred matters relate to social security coordination. The provisions in the bill allow the UK government and or where appropriate a devolved authority to make regulations to amend retained direct EU legislation relating to the social security coordination regime which is retained in UK law by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. I stress, this will enable policy changes to be delivered following the end of the transition period, depending on the outcome of negotiations with the EU on the future relationship. Then specifically in relation to Ireland, the UK signed an agreement with Ireland in February 2019, which protects the social security rights of all UK and Irish citizens moving within the common travel area. The Minister for Future Borders and Immigration and the Minister for Disabled People, Health and Work asked the then Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargey, 
to agree that the Northern Ireland Social Security coordination provisions remain in the bill and to agree to bring forward the necessary legislative consent motion. Now, if the Northern Ireland provisions are omitted from the Westminster Bill, it would be necessary to bring forward a further Assembly Bill to ensure that the Department for Communities has the power necessary to amend retained EU law on Social Security. Now, our working assumption is that such a bill would mirror the Social Security coordination provisions of the Westminster Bill in conferring powers on Northern Ireland departments. However, Clause 5 of the Westminster Bill also makes provisions for regulations to be made by a Minister of the Crown and the devolved authority acting jointly. Given that the retained regulations are, as I said before, a somewhat complex web of accepted and devolved matters, the availability of the option of making regulations jointly may provide a useful way to amend the law in a coherent way. Devolved competence would be respected in that such regulations would require the approval of the Assembly before being made. Based on the anticipated progress of the Westminster Bill, it would be likely that if we had to go down that route, if there was a Northern Ireland Bill, it could not be introduced to the Assembly before September at the very earliest. Such an Assembly Bill would be unlikely to complete its passage before Spring 21, and that's assuming a slot could be obtained in the legislative programme. This would leave Northern Ireland at a disadvantage. Sorry. As there will be no power for the Assembly to amend the EU Social Security Coordination Regulations until the Bill completed its passage. So changes could be made to the EU Social Security Coordination Regs in GB, but the Northern Ireland Assembly may not be able to bring in these changes until a later date. It's anticipated, as you would appreciate, that there will be very significant demands across departments for bills to be progressed through the Assembly before the end of the current mandate. Retaining the Northern Ireland provisions in the Westminster Bill would help to relieve some of the, accept of the expected pressure on the legislative programme. We'd also have the advantage of ensuring that these essential new provisions can be enacted as soon as possible. Discussions between the EU and the UK on Social Security coordination are ongoing, and retaining these provisions in the bill will ensure that any necessary changes can be brought forward for Northern Ireland at the same time as changes being taken forward in GB. As members are aware, the LCM process and the committee's role in the process are set out in standing or orders. Um, and I can confirm that the executive has agreed to proceed on the basis of a, of a legislative consent memorandum. We're happy now to answer any questions or clarify any issues which members may have. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for that. Um, you've kind of answered everything that I have written down here about how, how the, the, the Minister of the Crown and devolved authority acting jointly, what way that would work. You've answered yeah. that. And I suppose it was just the, the follow up was just to ask then, uh, you know, if the Assembly didn't agree to this, what would be the, you know, the, the ramifications of that, which I, I think you've probably have answered pretty well as well. Good. So I really don't have anything much further than that. Any other members have anything they want to ask on? Well, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, well, it's just following on um, from the chair's point, you know, what would be the ramifications um, if the Assembly did this itself? Um, if we don't, I appreciate the pressure on the legislative programme that's coming forward, but if we did do it ourselves and we weren't in sync with um, the rest of GB on this, uh, what is the financial or other ramifications for the Assembly then? Um, can I ask Jerry? He would be able to give you some information on that if you ask Jerry. Yeah, um, I, I would assume that we, we would be working on the actual basis that um, say that there was any extra costs here for benefits, okay, which wouldn't be the case inside England, Scotland, Wales, then uh, we here would have to pick up those costs. Mm -hmm. But again, it's until we know as, as to what the future shape uh, as such happens to look like, then it's very hard for us to try even to guess as to what costs might be. I think that's probably my concern is the fact that we don't know what the future will look like. There's no white papers on this. There's no indication um, of what potential could be coming down the road. Um, 
Can I just ask, you said that the executive have agreed to the LCM as a proposal. Can I just ask for clarification as to what the minister's position is on this LCM? Well, the minister has approved it. Okay, so there's no issues with that. Okay, um, and, and there's no viability in ourselves taking this forward or you know, for the assembly to do it ourselves? Well, um, I would have to say that I find it very hard to see any um, interim benefit because all, all that we're doing here is actually to give powers for us um, to actually make uh, such uh, and some future sets of regulations. And uh, there isn't anything in this bill which actually, of its own right, as such, uh, makes any changes to any overall policy for Social Security. All, all this is doing is giving a power. Uh, and actually that power can only be exercised with your control, you know, as such for the assembly's control. So for any future regs which we were going to make, then, then actually we would be coming to the committee as per usual, uh, and then uh, so the regulations would uh, so have to be led before the assembly in, in draft, uh, and they would also have to be uh, so it's quoted for, you know, by the assembly. So, so I think there's full control there. I think my concern was in, in the paperwork that we have received under its page 21, Schedule 2, where it talks about um, if we were bringing anything forward, we would be required to consult with the UK government. But if they're making any changes or any additions, do they have to notify us in advance? Or is it just simply that we once agree in this and this way forward is they can set whatever they like without having to consult with the devolved nations? Well, I, I'm certainly here, um, as is the case for any other sets of regulations, which we would end up making, we, we here would work very closely with GB on them. And uh, I, I, I think, um, I, how do I put this? Um, certainly, but there would be things in, in, inside those regs which uh, such don't fall to the Assembly. Oh, okay, because they fall into uh, Schedule 2 uh, to the Northern Ireland Act. And therefore, that they wouldn't have to consult with us. Okay. Um, but for anything at all which would fall within our area or, or which would fall within the control of the Assembly, well, then yes, they would fully consult with us. Uh, and we, in turn, would be consulting with the committee. Okay, I'm just concerned that we've already seen as Northern Ireland that we do take a different viewpoint to some social security measures to the rest of the, of the UK. Um, it would be useful. I'm just concerned that. Um, things can be done to us, and if we want to do anything different, then we will be the same as the mitigation measures, have to go separate on that rather than having a, a whole UK discussion. If we're entering into the legislation um, where, we're, where Westminster um, takes that full control, it still leaves us without the opportunity, for instance, to introduce back into Social Security things like our mitigation measures here. Uh yeah, well, I, I'm not sure that you know, you know the fact that this has been done under under the power in, inside this bill, or whether or not we do a further bill to give us the power to make regulations. I'm, I'm not sure that that would uh, such change that situation okay. uh, at all. Both would just be giving us a, a power to make regulations. If, if in the future that the the NI assembly wish to bring forward some law, you know, to do something very different, well then you know, okay, that is uh, such within the control of the assembly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No other member has indicated that they want to speak or ask a question. Oh, sorry. Now Mark has. Mark Durkin. Just wait, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Anne, uh, Jerry, and Seamus for the presentation. And to Kelly there, who, who asked a few of the questions that I also have concerns about. Just wondering what is, would be the disadvantage to people here, or, or, or people even not here? Uh, of us going down the route, as Kelly sort of floated the idea there that, that we do the bits that we can do in the Assembly, and I know there would be a delay, but what would be the impact of that delay on people? Would there be a detrimental impact? Well, it, it, you know, it's again, it's until we see what the shape of, of any future deal happens to look like, and so I can't say, but it could be that and I, I don't know, and I don't have any way of actually guessing this, but it, but it could be there, you know, you know, there may be something in it which, in fact, would, uh, would uh, such work out better for people coming here. Mm -hmm. and be. That they could gain under it, or indeed, uh, but again, I, I, I would have to stress that I, I don't have any way of I, uh, knowing that. It's one of the other issues might be, um, 
and, and say that we did go down the route of having our, our own separate bill, then um, it, it could be that we could find that the actual set of regulations in, inside Northern Ireland couldn't actually work because of changes which may, may have, have been made elsewhere the regulations by the government over in England. You know, and we could have a situation where we were sitting with a set of regulations which can't actually function. No, but again, it's until we see what they look like, then it's very hard for us to call. But, but I, I would again come back to the point that all, all they were doing here is actually give us a, a power to make regulations, and those regulations fall fully within the control of the NI Assembly. You know, so um, it's just I'm not, you know, of my own self absolutely clear what difference it would make. You know, I've been done by a, a bill of the Assembly as opposed to you know, actually using the route which we have before us. But again, that's a matter for the Assembly entirely. Yeah, and, and in terms of potential future changes, you say there the assembly would be consulted. Could you yeah, define yeah, I, consulted? Do, do you know, will we be told what's going to be done, or will we be asked what's going to be done? Certainly, I and for any of the changes which are going to be put in these regulations, then then I suppose we as such would be coming to the committee, okay, mm -hmm. with what these uh, and proposals are. But I, but I think we are all, all aware that um, you know as, as what is going on at the moment is there are, are talks going on between the EU and the UK government, and Social Security will probably be part of the overall settlement, um, which comes, and we are, uh, and we aren't involved in, in those talks per se. Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of coulds and mays. I don't, know, I don't want to, I to think, shoot, shoot, shoot them in the here. I think I think the important thing perhaps to regard this as it's an enabling power. It doesn't actually mean that um, you know it enables us to have reg regulations, but the regulations will follow the process that or that other regulations would follow. So the assembly will have the normal scrutiny that it would have if this would be done done a totally different way. So whether the primary power to make the regs comes from the uh, UK legislation or from ours. It, it's exactly, the, it's just the power. It's it's the how it's done on the ground that is the area that you would have concern about, but that's something that the assembly would, would have scrutiny of. Yeah, it's, it's just, I'm, I'm always a bit dubious about LCM. Um, like I say, I, I definitely don't want to shoot the messengers here, but we've heard okay. again and again that this isn't the way that we want to do business. We'd rather not be doing this, whether it be accelerated passage or LCMs, but it seems to be the only way we are doing business. And I know we're an extraordinary we're time. In it. Yes, exactly. But, but, uh, I mean, how, how long has this or was this sitting on the previous minister's desk? Uh, but before it's now come to us when we're right on the, the cusp of the summer and, and you know the window for us to legislate ourselves on this is practically closed. It, 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 it just doesn't sit comfortably with me. Uh, any LCM, I, I, I'm not overly enamoured with, but when you're dealing with welfare and social security issues and, and EU issues, and we're tying ourselves uh, further, uh, maybe to Westminster on those, I, I, I just don't be very comfortable with it. But like I say, it did. There is a very limited scope of areas that we're looking at with this. You know, I've described what they are. It's not the whole, I mean, it's not going into the de detail of of entitlement to PIP or entitlement to UC. It, 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 it's the coordination. It's only looking at coordination. Okay, now, thank you, folks. I'll have more of a look at it. I have to confess, I, I haven't read fully through all the, the a big agenda for today. I have looked at it, but, but maybe I will in more detail. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you, Mark. Um, Sinead, you're wanting to come in? Hey, Chair, um, and I suppose just following the vein of the last two um, speakers, you know, it's, it's an extremely difficult one to try and predict um, because we don't know what's going to be coming down the track at us. Um, and I suppose Anne probably um, answered my question there. I was going to say, you know, regardless of whether the Assembly does this or whether Westminster do, does this, um, you know, what what would the potential negative impacts be for anybody currently claiming Social Security here? Um, but I suppose you, you were saying there, Anne, that this is not really dealing with that at the minute. It's not the nuts, nuts and bolts of, of, um, of HIP and other benefits. So perhaps 
conversation for a for for a later a later stage. But um, yeah, I, and I I sort of concur with what Marcus said. You know, it's you know I, I would need to really get a better understanding of what this actually you know entails. And I suppose we we, we probably don't have time for that today. But um, you know. Note, note the presentation and, and the information and we'll take it away and, and try and digest it better. Okay. Okay, thanks, Sinead. Okay, no other members want to raise any issue or concern at this stage. Okay, um, thank you. Anne, Anne and Jerry, you're staying with us for the next one, isn't that correct? Right. And Michelle yeah. and Seamus are leaving us and we're also being joined then by Doreen. So we should then have um, Anne, Jerry and Doreen then for the next part. So members, we're going to move on then to agenda item six, which is the departmental briefing on the pension schemes bill. You'll find that at page 67 of your pack. And again, Anne, over to you. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm, yeah, you're, yep, hello. You're on. Right, okay. Uh, once again, pleased to have the chance to talk to you today about the proposed assembly pension schemes bill. This bill corresponds to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2017. The bill followed on from the 2017 Act and <coughs> seeks to introduce a new regulatory framework for master trusts in Northern Ireland. It will introduce, firstly, an authorisation and supervision regime for master trusts, that's a form of multi-employer occupational pension scheme, and secondly, a ban or cap on early exit charges and member born commission that arise <laughs> under existing arrangements as well as new arrangements. We've provided the committee as before with fairly comprehensive written briefing on the bill together with a copy of the draft bill and, expl and explanatory and financial memorandum. Um, if you're content, I'll run through the main provisions of the bill. Yep, go ahead. Part, part one is about master trusts. The pensions landscape has changed significantly over recent years, and as a result, the way in which people can save and access their pension savings has been transformed. Automatic enrolment has resulted in a significant increase in the number of people being enrolled into a workplace pension. Master trusts have become a popular vehicle for employers, particularly small and my. Oh, hold on to text, you've frozen on us, Anne. We're having a technical difficulty. Jerry, do you can you brief us on it, or is Anne um, or Doreen? It's just Anne has frozen. We can't hear her. Yeah, I, yeah. that's okay. Doreen will carry on then. Yeah. Oh, okay, she sounds like Anne. I know you wanted to. Okay, go ahead, Doreen. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'll uh, pick up where Anne left off. Master trusts have become a popular vehicle for employers, particularly small and micro employers, seeking to enrol employees into an occupational pension scheme. A master trust is a form of multi-employer occupational pension scheme for unconnected employers where, instead of the employer setting up their own pension scheme, the scheme is provided by an external organisation which runs a pension scheme for numerous employers. Such schemes offer benefits to both employers and members. They can spur competition in the market and allow for economies of scale, providing value for money. They are also an efficient solution for smaller employers for whom setting up an individual pension scheme would be difficult and prohibitively expensive. Currently in Northern Ireland, Master trusts are regulated in accordance with occupational pension legislation. However, that legislation was developed with single employer pension schemes in mind, and consequently, it doesn't take into consideration the different structures and dynamics of master trusts, which give rise to different risks. The bill is a response not to a fundamental problem with master trusts, but rather to the exponential growth in membership. In 2010, across the UK, there were 0.2 million members of Master Trust. By November 2019, across the UK, there were 16 million members in 37 Master Trust schemes, <coughs> holding more than 36 billion in assets. 
The introduction of a new authorisation regime is designed to address a legislative gap and to try to prevent problems arising in the future. The aim is to ensure that essential protections are put in place in a way which is proportionate to the risks experienced by master trusts. Under the new regime, master trusts will be prohibited from operating unless authorised by the pensions regulator. The bill sets out specific requirements which must be met in order for a scheme to be authorised. For example, the persons involved with the scheme are fit and proper persons. The scheme is financially sustainable. The scheme funder has met specific requirements. The systems and processes used in relation to the scheme's governance and administration are sufficient to ensure that the scheme runs effectively and the scheme has an adequate continuity strategy. In addition, the regulator will also be given new powers to supervise master trusts, enabling it to intervene where schemes are at risk of falling below the required standards. The regulator must be notified in writing if significant events occur in relation to an authorised master trust scheme. The intention is that the list of significant events will capture events which could affect the ability of a master trust to continue meeting the authorisation criteria. For example, the scheme may have a change of trustee. As the fitness and propriety of a trustee is linked to the authorisation criteria, the regulator must be informed of such a change so that the new trustee may be assessed against the relevant standards. The regulator will always seek to support and assist those involved in the running of a pension scheme. However, there need to be clear consequences for schemes which fail to comply with their duties. Information gathering is an important part of the regulator's toolkit and the Pensions Northern Ireland Order 2005 already makes it a criminal offence for individuals to fail to provide information requested by the regulator. The bill extends these powers to include those involved in the running of master trusts. Ultimately, the regulator also has the power to withdraw a scheme's authorisation, essentially forcing it to leave the market. These powers are designed to ensure that those managing master trust schemes continue to work to protect the interests of members. Turning now to the remaining provisions in the bill, are you content for me to continue? Yes, go ahead, Doreen, thank you. Part two deals with administration charges. Since the introduction of the new pension freedoms in April 2015, which enable many people aged 55 and over to access their pension savings more flexibly, individuals faced a range of potential barriers, including incurring early exit charges when seeking to access their savings. Schedule 18 to the Pensions Act, Northern Ireland, 2015, allows the Department to make regulations that restrict charges or impose requirements on certain pension schemes. The Bill amends the 2015 Act to allow the Department to make regulations to provide that any term in a contract which is inconsistent with something in the regulations made under Schedule 18 is overridden. For example, if a contract that is in place between the trustees or managers of the scheme and the person who provides services to the scheme permits an early exit charge that is higher than the level of the early exit charge cap when it is introduced, this would allow that term to be overridden. This supports the policy intention of capping early exit charges in occupational pension schemes and banning member-born commission arising under existing contracts, those which were entered into before the 6th of April 2016. In conclusion, the pensions market is continually evolving and modernising. It is clear that there is a need to ensure there is adequate regulation for master trusts, given how they have developed since the introduction of automatic enrolment. An equality impact assessment on their proposals was consulted on between December 2016 and February 2017. No adverse impacts were identified. 
By most standards, automatic enrolment can be considered a success. The Bill aims to ensure that members are only enrolled in high quality schemes which look after their interests. Well managed schemes will help secure pension incomes in retirement. The Bill therefore is firmly centred on further safeguarding workers' pensions. Thank you. We will now do our best to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you for stepping in there. Um, as, uh, just a couple of points, probably more than questions. Um, the, the fact that there were so many, uh, the, the membership of this increased so dramatically, I assume that's due to automatic enrolment is the, the reasoning behind that. And did you say there at the very end that there, that, um, there, there was no implications um, for existing schemes identified? Um, when the legislation is implemented, and also then just finally, um, how long will it take um, the existing schemes to be authorised um, when it is implemented by the pension regulator? Okay, I think we're three points there. Um, oh, okay, working backwards, um, it's in terms of how long will it take to be authorised. At the moment, inside Northern Ireland, we um, think there is only the one master trust scheme. Uh, you know, which is uh, still functioning, and that scheme has got scheme members inside Northern Ireland, but also scheme members in England, Scotland, and Wales. So, therefore, for, for it to be able to uh, just carry on, that scheme has uh, actually had, had itself um, brought into the list of authorised schemes on, under the law in England, Scotland, and Wales. So, so that scheme is, is already fully compliant. Oh, okay, with everything which we're going to do under, under this bill. Okay. Um, okay, now to go to the second point, if I can remember it. Um, I, I think the point Doreen was making was uh, it's about the e EQIA, and that was that we didn't find any adverse impacts on any of uh, uh, various categories which are covered by Section 75. Oh, okay, categories. Um, you know, and that's what she meant when she said there was no adverse impacts which had been identified. Oh, right, okay. okay. Okay, that was EQIA. And your first query, I, I can't recall. So, um, just about the, the, the dramatic increase in, in, in enrolment, and I, I, I assume that's just due to uh, but being having automatic enrolment now. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, our, our understanding is that it is uh, due to that. It's the fact we have now got a fairly large number of um, firms, or, or, or indeed very small employers, and uh, they have to put their workers into a, a scheme. Uh, and for them to set up their own scheme would actually be very cost yeah. um, prohibitive. So, so really what these schemes do is, is that they can put their members in, in those schemes and they can cater for a, a whole range of firms or indeed small employers. And it should, yes, make, uh, it should make things easier then as well? Um, yeah, yeah, well again, really um, all, all, all of this has been going on, so all, all that we want to do is to make sure that any, anybody who has joined one of these master trusts, any, any master trust, um, have, have to follow the law and said so there would be a, a good scheme you know, there for people to be safeguarded. Even, even though uh, at the moment inside Northern Ireland, as far as we're aware, there is only the one scheme operating, you know, you know, there is nothing to stop other, other schemes coming into the market. You know, and so that's why we need to bring this law in to make sure that any future schemes you know, also have to comply fully with these uh, rules. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Thank you for explaining that. Um, do members have any questions that they want to ask? I think Fra McCann has his hand up. Fra? Fra, I can't hear you. Hold on one wee minute to see if we can get the microphone on to you. I think it's on now, is it? There you go. That's you. The, uh, it's just, just a, a, a short question. You said that there are a number of new schemes coming on board. And I remember when this was coming through, and I'm sure you're right, I think there was a big rush on, rush on to get people to enrol. And uh, there, there, there was some concerns at the time. Obviously, much of that has been ironed out. But uh, any new scheme coming on, have people, uh, can people opt out of the scheme that they're on and go into a new scheme if they feel it's more uh, beneficial for them in the long run? Um, yeah, you know, that's quite a complicated question. I, and so most, um, the, the way automatic enrollment I, and it tends to work is that the it is up to your firm or, or to your employer to choose a, a scheme, okay? Uh, and they set it up. All, all the, uh, it's only duty under law is for them to put you into a, a scheme. 
and, and they normally can uh, and so opt for a scheme. But, but anybody can opt out at all. There's nothing says that, that you have to stay inside that scheme. Well, well hey, and that, uh, the, the, the reason I asked the question that this, the concerns of my memory service read at the time was that uh, companies coming in uh, with, with uh, organizing and running these schemes uh, that at the time there was some difficulties ac across a number of pension schemes and people were obviously concerned with the direction that was taking them. Yeah, well, well, like that's why that we are bringing in this law for master trusts be because we did have a number of schemes which were up, up and running uh, and we wanted to make sure that they all, all were going to meet, you know, uh, so it's very high standards uh, and that's what we're doing here with this. Now, at the, at the time, though, there were there also was a, a scheme which was brought in for the whole of the UK called Anson Nest, and um, any anybody could join it. Okay, it's one which was run uh, as a non-profit scheme. Yeah, national employment savings trust scheme. You know, and so um, I, I meant that employers could opt into that if if they uh, and so wished. You know, so they didn't have necessarily join one of these master trusts, but it's just master trusts have, have become very popular. And as, as you said, there's a very large number of people now inside master trust schemes. And we think it is important to make sure that, that, they're, that, that any scheme which is running in, inside this area, that, that they have to the highest standards. And that's all we're trying to do with this bill. Okay, sir. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. For anybody else, any question, comment, Kelly? Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, I get absolutely the point of this, it's making sure that those master trusts will be run very well to protect people's money, but I'm just wondering um, if government took a different consideration towards pensions in the future, say for instance there was a, a legislation made about environmental um, protection or any such thing, um, could this legislation be used to, for government to introduce that type of criteria for a master trust to have to comply with? Um, um, certainly for this current bill, um, I, I would have to think a wee bit about that. You're asking me whether or not um, an, an amendment would be within scope. Uh, you know, obviously that would be a matter for the Speaker, but uh, I would have to think about it. Though, um, oh, no, no, I'm not thinking as, about as amendment. You know, I'm just thinking Sorry, if in a future government thought that, for instance, they didn't want to be in, or anybody to be investing in, say, for instance, petrochemicals, could they make or require master trust schemes to have to uh, abide by that type of criteria? Yeah. Um, as, as you know, there is a, a further pension schemes bill which is ongoing uh, at the moment, uh, and it's, it's actually going through Parliament. Uh, and you'll, you, you will uh, uh, recall that you. Um, you know, you actually uh, had actually looked at, at, at the LCM for it. Um, certainly, uh, as it has been going through, one of the issues which has been raised has been about uh, its environmental issues, um, especially from the point of view of uh, as I said, for changing climate. Um, and uh, so, I, I think maybe that there may some, be something happening there which may be of interest. Okay. Um, There's a task force that's been mm -hmm. set up, and uh, it has made recommendations. Um, to government, so as uh, Jerry says, there is potential there for uh, something to be carried in the bill. Um, I, I, I think when we came before you that we said that we would be coming back to you to actually speak about further uh, as such changes to the bill. Um, I, I, think, I think that's one of the undertakings which we give you, and I, and I think one of the issues which we will be speaking to you about shall be, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's about climate change. And the governance. Asking. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, no other members have indicated they want to make comment or ask any questions. No. Okay. Then that's us finished. Then um, I don't know if Anne is still with us or she has gone. So thank you to Anne. Thank you to Jerry. And thank you also to Doreen um, for joining us today. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank Thanks you. very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item number seven, which is a departmental briefing on the Supporting People programme. Members, you've been provided with a briefing paper starting at page 170 of your meeting packs. Um, the paper begins at page 165 to 169. Or also, or sorry, there are also papers from 165 to 169 which um, also have relevance and relate to questions on supporting people the committee had raised uh, at meetings several weeks ago. 
So with us today, we have Siobhan McCauley, who is the Director of Regional Services with the Housing Executive, and Paul Price, Director of Social Housing Policy and Oversight with the Department. So Siobhan and Paul, are you there with us? Paul's definitely here, we know that. Paul, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, can indeed. Paul, you're very welcome. Yeah. I don't know okay. if Siobhan is with us or not, is she? We don't see her here on our list. But um, if you can go ahead and brief us, we're happy enough with that, Paul. Well, I can certainly start. Okay. Um, um, for some sort of operational detail, it'll be, it'll be handy if Siobhan joins us. Okay. But I will... Um, okay, we'll go and find out where she is. And you, you I will begin. Go. Shall I I'll begin? Shall I? Um, okay. Would that help? Yep, go ahead, Paul. So... Um, it's on the 21st of May, I think, the committee um, requested a briefing from us on the, uh, on the additional 10 million that uh, at that point had it, the executive, the Northern Ireland executive, had just determined would be um, passed to the housing executive to, to provide extra funding for supporting people programme. Um, uh, since then, we've written to you on this subject more broadly about how we're assisting the SP programme in the, in the current COVID crisis. Um, we've written to you on both on the 4th of June and in the letter you've just referred to on the 8th of June. Um, I'm going to cover all of these things. I, I'm, I'm conscious also that actually, since the committee returned, I don't think we've given you a briefing on SP. Um, we may have touched on it briefly in the sort of induction materials, but I'm, I'm going to I'm going to give you a sort of one minute intro as well, if that's okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, what is the SP program? It's uh, it's the Supporting People program. It is a grant program um, which is administered um, by the Housing Executive, um, funded by DFC. And through this program, um, around well over eighty uh, different providers of housing support services through over around 800 different housing support schemes, um, provide services to about 19,000 households, uh, services that crucially enable those households to live independently. Um, uh, it's, uh, if you like, uh, I think a very sort of simple way of defining the kind of contribution that the SP programme makes is that it is a, for vulnerable groups, a preemptive service. It's, it maintains the dignity of an independent housing solution for these people, but also preempts them then um, having to move beyond that setting to inst institutional care settings under health or perhaps under justice. Um, so it is of vital importance. And the services are provided in four thematic groups, homelessness, young people, older people, and people with a disability, including um, mental health and learning disabilities. Um, and the budget is, well, since 2015, has been maintained at 72.8 million per year. We often say that budget is protected at that figure. Um, that is not to... Um, deny the perspective of providers on that figure, which is who would regard that as a flat budget, and indeed it is, relative to all other budgets, of course, um, it has not been reduced, again, because of the value we set on the programme. That was established by ministers before they, before the, um, the executive stopped in 2017, carried on by officials. The budget for 2021 has yet to be established by the DFC minister, an opening allocation has been made based on last year's budget, but the budget has not been set yet for this year. Um, the 10 million, so that's, that's the programme in a nutshell. The 10 million, um, <clears throat> it's, um, well, what, what the executive has done actually is, is not just provide 10 million. Um, the 10 million is for vulnerable groups. Um, the executive has also agreed that um, Reserves held by SP providers, otherwise that would not have been able to be spent on, 
uh, on relieving pressures during the COVID crisis, uh, those, those shall be opened up. And there was also some additional funding, 247,000 um, held over from 1920 um, that was otherwise an underspend on the programme that we've been able to utilise. So there is a, uh, there's, there's a range of support the executive has offered to the SP programme. Um, I'm going to come back also to a further bid for PPE um, towards the end of my remarks. Um, that is the total response the executive has made to several bids that the housing executive has made to DFC from the department, then on to the Department of Finance in the period from 16th of March to 17th of April. I mean, there was a flurry and I, I mean, a real <laughs> um, flurry of activity um, in the latter half of March and all through April to secure funding, I'm, I'm sure right across the Northern Ireland uh, executive. Um, in SP, this, this, this represented several different bids as pressures began to emerge in the real moment, in the real, in the real teeth of the crisis. Um, and those bids totaled 13.8 million. And those bids were made, uh, I'll, I'll break that down for you provisionally. Um, 6.4 million was bid for extra staffing costs. I think this is the real heart of the of what the additional support from the executive is for. Um, the housing support services that SP provides to those 19,000 households are largely to do with housing support workers. They are salaries, they are staff. Um, the impact of COVID um, significantly threatened the continuity of those services, um, staff absence rates for obvious reasons in the context of the pandemic um, started to go up. The maintaining of housing support services was a key action in the executive's COVID strategy. Um, and this, it had an alarming rag status really that, that suggested we needed to direct funding at this to make sure additional staffing could be um, funded by the SP programme. Uh, and so that's really the, the heart of the bid um, separate to that, um, 1.1 million was bid for um, contingency and cleaning costs. 2 million was bid for, for the loss of income related to the lower density levels imposed upon the programme. So if you, if social distancing, isolation, um, quarantining, um, if these things have imposed lower density volumes on the programme. Those have an impact on the programme's income, uh, not least because density levels um, affect housing benefit received by the programme. And then lastly, there's also a loss of income for other issues, mainly around the loss of social enterprises. A lot of the charities that operate supporting people's services also fund those services, not in addition to the grant we give them from the social enterprises they conduct, the charity shops, the cafes and so on. And obviously lockdown shut that income stream down. So um, the 10 million and the additional measures I suggested by the executive uh, uh, have been put also in place by the executive are a combined response to the bids for pressures in those areas to maintain the services, to keep those services going to 19,000 households. Um, the housing executive is currently working on, the money has gone across the housing executive in the June monitoring round, and they are currently working on how that money will be um, distributed and then um, monitored with all good governance. Um, I was going to mention a PPE, um, providing housing support services in the context of a pandemic um, means providing staff with personal protection equipment. Um, not of the particularly intense kind, not, not, not of the time, kind of appropriate for clinical settings or for um, generally for, uh, say, aerosol generating procedures, but certainly a level of personal protection equipment is necessary. Um, trusts were providing that equipment to all SP schemes until the 12th of June. Um, from the 15th of June, for SP schemes that are solely funded by the housing executive, i.e. that not co-funded by health, um, the housing executive has set up a supply mechanism and um, the department has provided at its own risk an assurance that that mechanism will be funded and has bid to DOF to, to um, 
from that pressure a bid of three and a half million pounds. Um, but that's obviously a key point, a further bit of support that's obviously just as essential as all the other support for maintaining continuity of housing support services. Um, some facts about the presence of COVID in the Supporting People programme, uh, and these figures are as of the 12th of June. Um, in total, and by that point, 62 service users had tested positive, and most of those were among the older group. Of these, really, very sadly, 23 have died. Um, there are 36 positive tests among staff. Um, the profile of that presence of COVID within the programme, it has two spikes, um, one towards the end of March, another towards the end of April. But it is significantly diminishing now. I mean, there is very, very little. It's good news as of the 12th of June stats in terms of positive tests, there is very little presence of COVID in the programme, which is good news. Um, I'll add one final remark. I think the, um, the decision by the executive to give the extra 10 million and the flexibility on reserves to support the Sporting People programme um, reflected an awful lot of good work with colleagues in the housing executive, with colleagues in health, with colleagues in the Department of Finance, colleagues in the executive office. Um, uh, we were extremely pleased uh, and relieved. We thought it was a critical action that needed, needed this support. Um, it suggests perhaps links to health that we should develop as going forward with the programme. Um, but I think um, it also reflects how much the programme is valued. I come back to this decision by the executive always to maintain the SP funding. As I've said, there are two perspectives on that, but I would always be keen to stress that for various policy makers and decision makers over the years, it has always reflected the value held for the programme, as does this effort to secure further support in these these difficult times but that was all I was going to say I hope that was helpful yeah thank you I do appreciate that I don't think Siobhan has come in to join us at all has she no not as yet so um afraid Paul you might be able to answer all of her questions or there might be some that you're not able to answer um but thank you um and I, I absolutely agree with you I, I know going back to old DSD days and Fra will remember this whenever we talked about supporting people um way back then in the sort of the 11 to 16 mandate it was something that was very valued that we wanted to see the ring fence I remember there was times whenever they were going that their funding was going to drop way back then and certainly all, all MLAs um, across all parties were of the opinion that we, we, we couldn't allow um, their funding to be reduced. And I know it, uh, we keep saying it's been ring-fenced and it's been ring-fenced for years, um, but we, we do understand the reality of that as well, um, that it, it hasn't had an increase. Uh, so maybe looking ahead, uh, we never know what might happen, but certainly I would be of that opinion. It's extremely valued, and the work that they have been doing um, during this COVID period has been has been fantastic. Um, they've been a lifeline and a support for so many people um, within all of our constituencies. Um, I just have a couple of points because you've actually you covered everything you covered everything in great detail there. Um, and I just suppose I, I, I welcome the fact that the vouching that you're going to a little bit easier with the vouching. I, I've worked in the community and voluntary sector before, and I remember having to do vouching and what a nightmare it was to get all of that detail together. And we know that the the the, the past. Uh, sort of 12, 13 weeks, um, things have been done in a rush and emergent, it has been an emergency situation. So it's good to see that um, that has that that process has been put in place where it, 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 they're being allowed um, to put in estimates, I suppose, and then looking further ahead at proper vouching. That's that's good. Um, and also um, the, the numbers as well, they are relatively low numbers, albeit any numbers, anybody who's been diagnosed with COVID is... Is, is bad, but it has been relatively low. Oh, don't know who's trying to speak there. Oh, Siobhan, we have Siobhan in the room with us now. Hello, Siobhan, you're very welcome. Paul has given us a, a very detailed brief. So he has, um, and we're just asking. Hi, you... yeah. sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. You're quite okay, Siobhan, it doesn't matter. Do you want to add anything before can, can we. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Do you want to um, uh, add what you have to say, Siobhan? before we open up the meeting for questions? Um, 
Um, certainly, I've just come in, so I won't have heard what uh, went before. But just to say that the supporting people sector are delighted now to have received from the Assembly the uh, £10 million. Um, they've gone through a very difficult time. And there's around 850 schemes across Northern Ireland impacted uh, by this. The first payment we're issuing out next week of a uh, million and 51,000. So that um, has been looked for for a while. So I think it's good news um, from the Assembly side and good news for the sector. Uh, we will be monitoring and vouching um, aligned to these payments out. And just to say that um, the sector that assists 19,000 vulnerable people right across Northern Ireland um, acted very quickly aligned to COVID and are continuing to um, keep, I think, the uh, potential spread of COVID at bay here. And we get weekly um, updates aligned to every single scheme and where we're at with this. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. Um, Paul had gone into detail, uh, great detail uh, around where money had gone and to do with um, the vouching and to do with uh, PPE and various other issues. So um, I suppose if, if anything now, if we'll just open it up for questions. I suppose if, if, now that you're here with us, Siobhan, I wanted to ask you about the homelessness. And we know that yes. um, a lot of money has been put into to helping with that. And that's been brilliant. Supporting people has, you know, the entire scheme has been fantastic during this entire response. It was fantastic before this, but it, it, it's done it done great stuff. I suppose I just want to ask, um, as we come out of this pandemic, um, how will that the homelessness situation look then? You know, I, I know going back again years over the years of, of being part of this committee, um, when we looked at homelessness, um, we looked at uh, and street sleepers and all of that other stuff that goes on. There was never enough hostel accommodation um, for for the need. We know that, uh, and we know that's the case. So it's just coming out of COVID. And um, we know that a lot of people who are homeless um, under these circumstances as well, it could be, you know, where, where two parents have separated and you've got one person who requires um, somewhere to stay. And we know that deems as homeless as well. Um, so it's just where, where do you see this going then as we come out of the pandemic as to where all of these people are going to be housed um, uh, going into the future? Yes. Um, well, because the response has been so good, we're, we're, we're keen that um, we can continue with that, as in we've predominantly got all of our rough sleepers uh, off the streets at present, so the, the homeless team definitely have to be commended for that. What we're intending to do is, obviously, as it starts to lift now, we haven't been able to do our standard change of tenants and to utilise our full stock. So we will be starting to phase back into that so that we'll be able to start getting change of tenancies and then people moving that may not have been their long-term base to be into temporary accommodation. Um, in addition to that, in the temporary accommodation, as we look at how the co what is being managed and as we're seeing that the rates are going down uh, we would intend to try and open up a bit further on where we have uh, isolation units and some of the void areas aligned to that so we'd look to try to expand on that as well in addition to that um, we're looking and we're discussing with the department for community aligned to another area that we were supporting in which is those as such who don't have uh, recourse of public monies and um, they again would have, have made up some of the individuals who would be um, coming across as homeless. And we have been working closely on that. We're seeing if we can get a long-term uh, solution put into place. So there's a range of different um, options available to us. We also then obviously use some of our single lets as well, which is our private accommodation. And as this opens up a bit as well, we'll start trying to get back into utilising it as well. So it's every avenue that we can to try and ensure that um, long term, if we can, we can keep up the really good work on addressing rough sleeping and on managing the, the homeless as we have during this pandemic. No, that's good to know. And it's good to know as a constituency MLA, MLA as well that, that you know we're going to start with the change of tenancies because I know all of us as MLAs yes. will have lists of people um, who are, yes. are willing to move as well as those that are, are homeless are declared homeless as well. So that is good news, and I think that that would be a positive way forward. I think the general public would be glad to hear that as well 
as us um, MLAs. Just on another point to do with the amount, the money and where the money went to, um, whenever we look at our, our the supporting people and I mean the biggest the biggest service user group appears to be the older person um, appears yes. to be the biggest service user yet it is not the the largest recipient when it comes to the the overall funding now I understand with disability services a lot of those will be very specialized and uh, that uh, yes. you know will have added expense is there any other reasoning behind that just just uh, it just it, it, it doesn't balance you know whenever you look at the the, the demographic and the amount of people Yes, in the area, as you can see, in disability, it would be significantly higher. There would have been levels in that would, would have been Bamford, which is under transforming your care. We were moving out of an institutional environment uh, much more into a home environment. And there is a, a, obviously a, a cost associated with that. On older people, older people range and... Um, I suppose you will laugh because the range, I think, from older people can uh, it can vary from the age, I think, is 55 plus up to 85. Uh, and, and some will say that it's not necessarily older people. So depending on the nature of the requirement, there are a lot of those older people that may be in their own houses getting floating support. Uh, there may be a range that they need just a low level of housing support. And that's why we're able to use the funding to assist so many. There's around 10,000 of the 19,000 helped in that way. Um, and obviously, at the end of that scale, some of them is more costly when it relates to, to individuals who may have, for example, early stages of dementia. So really, it ranges on the level of independence with the in individual and the le level of support we're giving. Now, we are currently looking through our needs assessment and we are looking at our new strategy going forward on doing a level of balancing on what that's going to look like for the next three to five year period. And we are aware that over 30% of the population will be well over uh, 65. And so we may have to do a rebalancing um, in order to ad address different priorities moving forward. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. You had me a bit worried there when you talk about older people to be of 55. I'm glad I'm not an older person. <laughs> but, uh, it's a I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. thank you for that, Paul. Just I have one, just one final question, then I'll bring members in. And I suppose it's it's more for you, Paul, and it's to do with the supporting people reserves and the the mm -hmm. fact that um their people are being advised to use their reserves. Will that have any implications on any of those groups? Because I know reserves are are in place as well for redundancy or you know various things like that so do you foresee any implications with that i know that those groups will have other reserves because they're getting other funding streams um so uh, it's just supposed to ask i think that would be paul maybe or yourself siobhan are there any implications with them using those reserves i'll go um i'll go first i mean there are implicate they're wholly positive implications i mean um, um the this flexibility in terms of the numbers of providers who are going to fa who are facing additional cost pressures from COVID, um, only about 26 of them hold SP reserves, I believe is the number. Um, so it won't help all of those. It won't help a provider who doesn't have a reserve but is facing COVID pressures. They will need they will need help for 10 million. Um, but for those 26. Um, the fact is, I think the, 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 they were going to face the recoupment of this of this money. Um, so um, the, the flexibility to spend it on COVID pressures is entirely positive. Um, there shouldn't really, in keeping with the grant arrangements we have underpinning the program, there shouldn't really be SP reserves. I think I'll invite Siobhan to come in. Um, the situation we faced where there were SP reserves was um, it needed resolving, actually, uh, but then when COVID came along, that presented uh, an opportunity to make a, a potential solution for providers out of what otherwise was going to be something that needed resolving. But Siobhan can maybe add the detail there. Um, yes, I, I agree with Paul. It is a legacy issue, um, the SP reserves, and it is a debated area on, obviously, with very vulnerable charities and organisations on... At, at one level, there's an expectation to have a reserve, but on the other, it is public money. Um, it is only relating to 26 schemes, and what it will allow them to do is it is specifically restricted for SP. So it will be able to allow them to use this during the COVID period. Sorry, Siobhan. Siobhan is frozen on us. 
Paul, if there's anything further you want to add, and we'll see if we can get just one back. No, I think I think we were we were essentially telling you the same thing. Yeah. yeah. No, well, that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, I, I, I kind of had wondered why there were SP reserves in the first place, yeah. but yeah. Um, you've kind of answered that as well. So if they do spend their reserves, then, as you say, it resolves a bit of an issue that was there, a legacy issue there in the first place. Will they be able to claim that money back then through vouching, or is that just to, you know, uh, will they have to, or, or they just have to spend the reserves? So they, they, should, they, they can, shouldn't have SP reserves, really. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they will not be able to claim it back. Um, if, but if they, in addition to, if it, if it, if it doesn't resolve all of their COVID pressures, yeah. Um, then they will be able to draw on the 10 million. Okay. Of course. Okay, look, that's fine. That's all from me for now. Um, I'm going to open up to members. So, any members want to ask? Kelly, go ahead. Paul, thank you. Can I just um, investigate that a little bit further um, with the SP reserves? Um, I, whenever I ran a community and voluntary sector organisation, there was no such thing as a grant funder specific reserve. Are the are the groups the 850 or the 80 projects the 850 schemes are they not entitled to full cost recovery under the um, Concordat agreement with the community and voluntary sector? Uh, do you mean? The, must check was, out. the full cost recovery yeah. would be that there would be an allocation of reserves to ensure that a bona fide organisation would be able to continue to exist. So the reserve wouldn't be SP reserves; it would be corporate reserves. Oh, sorry, yeah. they are entitled to hold their own reserve. Yeah, okay. That's entirely, of course, yes. No, they're not. The they're, they're unspent SP grant should be returned at the end of the year rather than held in an SP reserve. Okay, and that um, does the SP grant then include full cost recovery allowances for those organisations? Well, the SP grant doesn't purport to cover all of their costs. It's a grant. It's a grant funding that the department, that the housing executive, gives to a provider organisation to assist it in the provision of services. Okay, so it's not full cost recovery. So it is sort of a bit out with. I don't think so. I, I would be if Siobhan's there but it, it's not the nature of our, our grant funding arrangements no okay. the, the full cost recovery is not it's not okay. it not is something base. it is something that we have to be aware of going forward i know that the the 72.8 million pounds has been retained over a number of years but in order to have sustainable partners delivering frontline services we need to enable them to have full cost recovery to develop further and, and to be sustainable um, can I just follow on from that? Um, you mentioned about the PPE, and it is something that, uh, that concerns me greatly. So you were able to get the PPE from the trusts up until the 12th of June, and then from after that period, um, there's a bid in now to purchase PPE. Where would that PPE be purchased from? Is it from the trusts? Um, no, the housing executive has um, set up a supply chain with the advice of Central Procurement Directorate in the Department of Finance, um, which um, uh, in line with executive policy is focused on, on local suppliers in the interest of building a resilient supply chain that can see us through, you know, um, great international demand and, and maybe numerous waves of COVID. Yeah. So um, we, we've basically gone in line with the rest of the Northern Ireland executive um, the, the public sector, apart from health, in, in, in working with CPD to, to set up uh, an arrangement that is in line with that. Um, is, is that does that have I mean, the actual, the actual uh, who the orders are going to? I don't have those details with me, but um, that, that's the emphasis in, in the procurement. No, no, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that because um, my concern would be that you'd be cut adrift and have to find your own suppliers when, when yeah. CPD have them, thank goodness. Um, my last question is more about the, the supporting people, the service users. Um, I work quite a bit with people with disabilities and older people um, outside of being an MLA and those that have shielded are extremely vulnerable and it's almost as if there has been a step backwards for some of those people. They're very tentative about going out at all if, if they're even thinking about that. I'm just wondering how much in your needs assessment going forward are you going to have to um, almost like go back to basics with some people to um, help them to continue to live independently and, and to be self-sufficient because just what I'm finding now, um, there's a lot of very, very vulnerable people there because they have been away from society for 12 
weeks. Um, they're, they're just not confident at the moment to go out. Can I just stop, can I just stop a wee minute, Paul? Because Siobhan is back as well, so we're going to ask for her to join back in again. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Um, look, I uh, I think that's a very good point. The um, we've begun work on a strategic needs assessment, which is, sorry, the housing has had, which is a considerable body of work prior to to COVID and its impact upon the program. I mean, the, and that impact is significant. I mean, there has been. There have been some services provided remotely during this, um, i.e. virtually through this period. Um, so I suppose we will have to, I, 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 we will have to take your point. I don't have anything, anything more to say than that. We will have to consider how, in our ongoing needs assessment, how COVID has changed the nature or should change the nature of housing support. Um, I think it's a fair point. We'll have to consider it. I don't know if you can add to that, Siobhan. I think the, the, um, current strategy and the needs assessment is flexible enough that it uh, in a way is already taking it into account and what i mean by that is that we have already been increasing our level aligned to floating support mm. so exactly as you said kelly there is a lot of people who will be expected to be in their own properties rather than in a group setting and that they will need a level of support and that's what the floating support does the other side on that is obviously those that are shielding and self-isolating you cannot as such be in contact with them for periods of time so that's where we're increasing up on our digital okay. um, our telephone and our remote access in order to to um, be able to ensure that we're preventing that level of isolation and, and the supporting people because it is that type of housing support lends itself very nicely to that um, we also have at the moment an innovation fund and in the last period of time through it we have looked at uh, digital and increasing aligned to digital access so that's an area I do think moving forward and exactly as you said it will be something that is just a, a different approach and how we deal with our clients but it will be something that will definitely take more prevalence coming out of uh, COVID that there will be more people feeling isolated and digital it really and telephone is going to be the way to go. Can I, do you mind Chair, if I ask, if maybe Siobhan could address Kelly's question about full cost recovery. I don't know if you heard that Siobhan. I, I, I didn't, sorry. Bed, but I think it might, um, uh, I think Kelly was saying, you know, Oh, well, I was basically saying our, our programme is supporting people, it's a grant funding model, it's not based on full cost recovery. I hope that's correct. Yes, um, the grant programme, the programme for supporting people is not such as a service, it's a grant. And the grant is a small level of funding within the mix. So within there, we have it, and that's why we have things like the, where the, we talked about restricted monies and monies purely for SP. Um, within the entities, so to give an example, a charity, they may have funding from other sources, which is currently going down, which is where they do, um, they go out and and they do their charity work to get funding in. They may have also funding from like social enterprises if they're running a cafe or they're running a charity shop. And then they will have funding aligned to housing benefit, which is a payment in kind. And then they have supporting people, which is very much for what we call like touch. So it is a very difficult thing to do full cost recovery because what happens here is they put, they're putting all their, their funding together. And as our grant goes up or down, as they argue, they subsidize it through other parts of their business. Yeah, I'm just and as about Paul the knows, for the last five to six years, they haven't had, and they've argued strongly on this, that they haven't had an uplift. So therefore they, they have, uh, they have demonstrated and shown in their accounts where they may sit in deficit in SP, but their their body is not in deficit because they've been using other sources of income to uh, cover the cost. Okay. Does that help? Uh, no, because I'm a great believer in, in um, full cost recovery for organisations. The way I used to do it was um, everything has 15% built into it for the core costs to make sure that the organisation can, can exist, um, but not not as a, a, a savings pot, believe me. It was always it was always there with the intention of covering a cost in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on. Um, Fra, I think I saw you waving at me on screen earlier. So, Fra, did you want to make a comment? 
chairman of the questions that I was going to ask has been asked, uh, but I'm sure I'll come up with something. Um, <laughs> I say, uh, as you know, over the years, I've been a big fan of supporting people, and uh, rather than the budget starting still, uh, in real terms, there has been significant cuts, a significant cut when they take in the, the inflationary freeze uh, that they have done on the budget o over the years. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, the, the, the present uh, circumstances, I have to say right across the board uh, that there has been a tremendous amount of work uh, put in. Uh, certainly where I live, and I've, I'm one of the people that have been uh, isolated and locked down. Uh, and then you see quite a lot of people going by who are doing tremendous work within uh, communities. Uh, but the point that I wanted to make was there was 11 point one million the fifth of May that was advanced, and uh, does that uh, go on top of the ten million that was allocated by the department uh, to to help uh, uh, to get people through that this, this period? And uh, the uh, in terms of the supporting people and the work that they have done, uh, because there has been some criticisms uh, in, in terms of like some of the housing associations that uh, trying to operate remotely. Uh, I know that people have said that, uh, at this meeting, people have said uh, that, uh, that uh, people have been in contact rather through phone, uh, but that physical contact uh, to try and defeat loneliness, uh, to try and uh, help and assist uh, has mostly been taken on by community groups rather uh, than those that are providing or the providers of uh, supporting people. Shall I, shall I answer the first part of that, Fra? I mean, um, um, the, um, I think I think I'm guessing the 11.1. Um, I mean, the housing executive before we uh, got news of the executive's decision to award an extra 10 million, the housing exec. What was happening was the providers were spending at risk. They were absorbing extra costs at risk at risk to maintain services and and and. and and um, either either exposing an immediate cash flow problem, or or uh, what was going to be a big affordability problem that would come out later in the year. Um, the housing executive, in order to address the first problem, the cash flow problem, advanced. I think the first quarter of the whole year's funding. I.e., so they 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 distributed more quickly than they otherwise would the chunk of the seventy two point eight out to providers to, to help with the immediate cash flow problem. I, I didn't know that that was 11.1, .1, but I, I think that's probably where that comes from. Um, the 10 million is entirely additional. Yeah, I mean, you're right. That, that is entirely additional on top of the total annual total of 72.8 uh, and is, but must be spent on COVID related pressures. Um, I think there have been all sorts of networks, um, some of them involving the housing executive indeed, and it's, um, it's community groups under its social enterprise strategy that have been holding together communities during the current, the last few weeks and have been helping distribute food parcels and so on. Yes, so there is a, there is a, there is a massive effort. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Siobhan. Um, no, on the first one, uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. There was major issues, obviously, for the sector and closing down quite quickly. And therefore, we gave them, an, uh, we gave them a payment exactly as uh, Paul has outlined which was the first quarter payment so that they were having no cash flow issues. And that is all uh, vouched funding. Um, then the 10 million is separate. That is specific to COVID as such. Um, in regard to going out and visiting, the issue we have is that obviously we need to adhere to our government policy. And the government policy was that people who are isolating need to be unfortunately in their house. Um, lockdown and people were not allowed to visit. So for some of these entities, it wasn't that they didn't have a desire to, to, to visit householders. They weren't allowed to government. Well, they weren't allowed to visit. So what they did was try to do alternative workarounds, which is trying to get some sort of equipment like laptops, trying to do digital phoning instead. But as we're moving, as you know, Fra, as we're moving out of that phase, then obviously all of that will be able to start up a bit further. We absolutely have to monitor it, um, but they, as, as these bubbles are being created, that will allow us to go into that, that next stage with um, some of the work that the supporting people teams do. And also, also, also PPE, you know, the supply of PPE will be vital there as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and um, we have uh, we have an order in for the PPE, and um, we have order forms out for more PPE, so that 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 will be there as a obviously as a health measure to protect them. Um, so as we move forward, I'm expecting or we're hoping to to try and as much as possible do as much uh, business as usual within the government guidelines. Sure, I would just come back to that, and, and I said at the start that uh, there has been tremendous work uh, that, that I know that. and I know that in my own area and uh, even stretching through it West Belfast from what I gather uh, is that uh, individuals from the housing executive have been on the streets with community groups yeah. uh, trying to make life better for people uh, yeah. to, to but I take it that at the end of this uh, like everything else there will be a complete review on how everything worked this uh, in, in relation to uh, monies allocated and uh, the, the, the provisions that were made? Absolutely, and we're mindful of that. And we have our internal audit who is advising us along to making sure that we will be able to do exactly that as vouching on everything well, that's can, expended. Can, can I just uh, throw in something? Now? Because I do think it's important uh, that uh, the, 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 the groups including uh, people from uh, your own organization uh, that uh, they uh, that they been groups that have been out working on the street can they be included in any review uh, because they can give you a great insight of how they felt out in the streets and were they seen absence, absences uh, uh, and, and some elements of this here that may help and assist and uh, uh, we come into a second wave of this. Certainly, um, we we phone around every day um, to all the providers, and we can certainly look at, as you say, getting some feedback. As you said, the users trying to get some feedback if we can from from users. So any lessons learned, we'll certainly take it on board. Right, thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Fra. Um, and I call in uh, Mark Durkin. Mark. Thank you, uh, thank you, Paula, and thank you, Paula, and thank you, Siobhan, as well. It's Hi, good Martin. to see you again. Yes. It's been a while. We go go way back. I know. Uh, it was just a few of the issues ha ha have been raised already, and it was in terms of the ten million that's gone, and, and I think it was the words Paul used were that that demonstrates how much the program is valued. But I think it is fair to say that a number of the, the workers there out on the front line who perform heroics 365 days every year, well, 366 yes, yes. <laughs> once every four years, uh, they don't feel valued. They, they, they don't feel valued at all. I think it is fair enough uh, to say that. And I wonder had any consideration been given. And I'm realistic to know, realistic enough to know there's not a, 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 a money tree somewhere in, in the department or, or executive. But had there been any consideration given the how uh, the dedication and the fact that they've gone even further above and beyond uh, over the COVID period might be recognised or acknowledged in any way? Um, well, in relation to the in relation to the SP program itself, seventy percent of our funding goes to the frontline workers. So we do skew the funding to ensure that it's not going in just to a central uh, facility, but that it is getting to frontline workers. The um, funding that is really helpful coming um, from the assembly, the ten million, uh, a part of that will be for. Um, staffing and bank relief staff. So in relation to staff that may have to self-isolate staff that may have childcare issues and therefore are unable to do their normal uh, duties, that will cover some of that. But I know that your question, which is over and above that, are they getting any uh, uh, additional financial reward? And the answer I don't is... I know. The, the, the difficulty on that is that, that, that the fund that we have does not allow for that, but it also would bring in a wider debate because there's all those individuals that are currently furloughed that will be going back in private sector into the workplace. And the impact of this is so widespread across the economy. Um, it, it, it would probably be something that would have to be looked at in its entirety. Um, but it, it, in the supporting people, I mean, I recognise that the frontline staff have been fantastic. Um, 
and we are, I suppose our contribution is that we are, uh, have got, and, and thanks to the Department for Communities, we did get a, an allocation this year and we got it, uh, it's, it's protected as such when other budgets were cut. So, so we welcome that and the fact that we can still at least financially support this full sector uh, at present. So that to me is a bonus, but I totally recognise um, it would be lovely to be able to, to, to give that, but we just don't we don't have the funding within the scheme for that. No, uh, no, no I that. Siobhan, and just, sorry, uh, Paul, in terms of, of the budget being protected and the allocation this year, that, that, that is great. Uh, but Fra spoke about inflation, meaning that in real terms it's less. Uh, you, you know, we're not blaming anyone for that. We, we can't. But... Uh, Another issue, uh, while inflation will mean that the 10 million isn't worth what, or, or sorry, the money that yes. support gets is, isn't worth what it was uh, a, a few years back, I think it might be fair to say, I don't know if either of you are in the position to tell me, that the demand on the services and support through supporting uh, people has grown exponentially in that time, which again re reduces the bang you can get for your 10 million. Or, or sorry, not. I keep going back to this ten million. Bang yes. you your buck. Yes, the the strategic needs analysis, as uh, Paul has highlighted, is it is advancing at pace, and it is demonstrating that the, the within these areas because it's covering disability, younger people, older people, mental level of mental health issues there within all of that, and then addictions and homelessness. So it's 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 quite a large span of uh, vulnerable clients there. So definitely in in all of those areas they're 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 demonstrating an increase. Um and and I don't think that would come as a surprise to to any of the members. Um, that that is the case. So we're trying to do our best uh, uh, with the funds we can to distribute it in a way as efficient and effective as we possibly can. I do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, no other member has indicated that they want to speak. So can I thank you, Siobhan and Paul, for your briefing today? And no doubt um, we'll be hearing from you in the not too distant future. I suppose um, when we look at COVID-19 and we look at the effects of COVID-19 um, going forward, uh, supporting people is going to be required even more in the future. Yeah. When we look at, uh, you know, we look at the levels of loneliness, we look at the levels of, of reduced confidence, especially in the elderly. I think Kelly brought that up, and we look at even addictions as well. Um, because of, of people being at home. Um, so it, it certainly is a, a most valuable service um, that will, I, I do imagine, and I'm sure you would agree, that there will be an increase in that service as we as we come out the other side of this pandemic. Absolutely, there, there will be. I, I mean, I'm so thankful to the sector. A lot of them historically in this uh, volunteered. They have been working throughout this whole um, COVID from start to finish and also I reviewed this morning Belfast Healthy Cities which shows on those that had COVID and the breakdown etc right across Northern Ireland there is there in levels of deprivation and in vulnerability and um, you can see that there's higher numbers and um, so it's something we're mindful of that moving forward definitely supporting people is going to be called on um, and and more than likely expected to do a lot more than than it is from a, a demand perspective. Yeah, Rick, thank you again. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, you, Siobhan, for joining us today, and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item eight, which is SL1 Universal Credit GP Reciprocal Arrangements Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, you've been provided um, with uh, on your pack at page 175. Um, the reciprocal arrangements between NI and Great Britain ensure that recipients of certain specified benefits suffer no financial detriment or break in claim as a result of moving from one jurisdiction to the other. The arrangements essentially provide that in respect of benefits falling within their scope, having effect in one territory, um, have corresponding effect in the other territory, so they stay the same um, wherever they travel within that territory, um, or within the, the, uh, the from here to, uh, I suppose, to, to mainland UK. So, members, I just want to ask, are members content that the department proceed to make this rule? Can uh, everybody happy enough with that? If you're not happy, raise your hand. 
Nope, everybody's happy. That's good. Okay, members, we'll move on then to agenda item number nine, which is correspondence. You'll find the correspondence memo at page 180 of your meeting pack. Um, so I see a hand up already. Um, so I'm going to go then to you, Siobhan. Or sorry, not Siobhan. Uh, Sinead. Sorry, Sinead. Sinead. Um, you have your hand up. Is there something you want to bring up under correspondence? Sin can't hear you yet, Sinead. Can we bring Sinead in? There you go. You're in the room. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, I see there's a quite detailed um, paper there on behalf of the, the arts and cultural sector, um, which is quite useful. Um, however, I think there's more. Uh, I think we would benefit probably from having them in, and I know that's a, a recommendation um, in, the, in that section. So it's just to say, you know, I would certainly be supportive and I think we should get them in as soon as possible um, because there's, there's things we need to drill down into in terms of the proposals. Um, you know, the, the NI Cultural Task Force and, you know, the Rescue Fund for Venue. So I think we members would benefit from, from a more detailed briefing from that collective group. Yep, I agree with that, Sinead. Thank you. And Kelly, did you want to come in and on that as well? I was going to say there's there's a significant number of groups that are linked into that one organisation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And they are quite wide ranging. I think in order to have a really effective presentation from them, we may want to get them to nominate two or three people to come along um, that can speak on behalf of so many of them, because we do want to hear what they have to say. Uh, but I'm, I'm very aware that they'll not all be able to be represented. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with, with both what, what you're saying. Um, I know next week we've got a pretty packed schedule, so would members be content um, if we look then at the following week for the 31st to ask for a briefing yeah. um, from representatives from the arts and culture sector? Yeah, they're happy yeah. enough with that, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, members, I've got Mark Durkin wants to come in. Can we invite Mark in? Okay, Mark, Hello. go ahead, Mark. Oh, hi. Thank you, uh, Paula. No, I was going to come in on that, but there seems to be harmony, and it, it, everyone agrees that that, that we could come in, and I, I look forward to that. To that. But another item uh, on correspondence, and I just thought this was the hook to do this. I didn't know whether we could have done it under any other business either. But it's the memo from the Finance Committee around the Housing Amendment Bill. Yeah. Uh, now, a number of members expressed concern in yesterday's debate at the nature in which the consultation uh, report had been published, I used published in a very, very loosely, on a Friday afternoon as a scrutiny committee, as a member of the scrutiny committee, I find that completely, completely unacceptable. We'll have different views on the bill. This isn't the case of sour grapes because my nominee has voted for my amendment. But uh, I think we should be writing to the department uh, expressing our dissatisfaction uh, at that. A number of members also made reference to ONS's view that uh, the amendments tabled would, would scupper the bill in some way for, for, for their purposes. And I wonder, would it be possible to seek clarity from the department? Maybe on two things. When uh, that report on the consultation was finished and passed uh, to the minister, did the minister come to our committee seeking accelerated passage for the bill uh, and not mention that that consultation report. You, you know, I, I, I do think we're entitled to ask this. And uh, the other one was on ONS, had the department sought and received any advice from ONS on the impact that any amendments of any nature might have had on that bill and their view of, of its original and central purpose, which was the reversal of the reclassification of housing associations. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for reminding me of that as well. They're all good questions. And I know certainly the minister on, in the chamber on Tuesday herself um, had, uh, you know, had also raised concern to do with the consultation um, as well as to why we, we as a committee didn't see that. Um, so I think, yes, we, we, just, we said then in the chamber on Tuesday, or I know I certainly said it as well in the chamber on Tuesday, that we as a committee would have to write um, to the minister to ask um, several questions. But I'm happy enough for those additional questions as well to, to be added into that. 
Um, I don't think anybody would have any difficulty with that. Um, are members content with that? If you're not content with any of that, raise your hand. I suppose we'll have to do it this way now. No, we all seem to be okay that we, we write them um, to the Minister and to the Department to find out those answers. Okay, members, nothing else then on correspondence that members want to bring up. I'll take that as we're all happy then to continue with the uh, with the correspondence mem memo um, as drafted. Um, so then I'll move on then to agenda item number 10, which is the forward work programme. And just remind members that next week we will have solace here um, to provide an update briefing and also we will have the department um, to brief us on the reform of liquor licensing, which is certainly welcome as well. Yeah. So any members have any comment? Are they content to note the forward work programme? Content? Yeah. Yes, everybody's yeah. content. Okay, then I'll move on to agenda item number 11, which is any other business. Can I ask members if there's any other business? Can you raise your hand? And uh, I think actually we've still got Mark in the room anyway, but any other business? Nope. Nope. Give it a minute. Nope, nothing. That's fine. I'll move then on to agenda item number 12, which is date, time and location for the next meeting. And just advise members that we will be meeting here in room 29 at the time of 2 p.m. next Wednesday, the 24th of June. Can I thank members for their attendance today? Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.